Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, yeah, so yeah, well, first off, yeah, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining, and, and thank you to the uh, to the Hashi Talks team of a putting this on together. It's great that now this year it's forty eight hours instead of uh, I think it was just twenty four last year, so that was pretty awesome. Uh, that and then giving me the chance to to speak on Boundary. Um, so for those who 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 may not know, Boundary is is one of the new tools that uh, HashiCorp released um, at at HashiConf uh, later la or late last year, I guess. Um, and, and it was a tool that kind of caught my eye um, pretty quickly, uh, just because um, it, it, it's kind of a tool that, that, like the title says, it's, it's, it's allowing you to get um, access to, to your workloads in, in, in clouds, and it could just be a single cloud or multi-cloud, uh, or even something like on-prem. Uh, but it's taking a different spin on it. It's using something like your, your just your sole identity, uh, whether that's like Active Directory or something. And, and we'll talk about that uh, to gain access um, to, to your workloads. Um, and so where I thought Boundary would be, would be really cool to, to try out is, is on a multi-cloud scale. So uh, if I have workloads in GCP, AWS, and on-prem, um, how can I use like a single tool, like a single entry point uh, to get to, to all of those workloads? Um, so that's what we're kind of uh, going to go through, uh, go through today. Um, so a little bit about who I am. Um, as, as Kay said, uh, my name is Jacob Mamaliti. Uh, I'm a consultant based out of, um, out of Toronto, Canada, and I work at a company called Arctic. We're a consulting, consulting company here. Um, and mostly, um, I focus on a lot of HashiCorp tooling uh, recently, especially more now than ever. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work uh, with Vault uh, and Console um, for, for customers. Um, and that could be stuff from, from starting their, their Vault journey from, from day one, uh, getting it set up and getting initially configured uh, to some more um, advanced deployments where um, looking at like replication and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then the same thing uh, with console too, uh, looking at how we can span data centers together um, to get uh, workloads talking to each other. Um, and with those tools, a lot of times uh, Terraform is usually involved somewhere. Um, it's, it's, it's typically either made to get infrastructure stood up uh, and all that sort of stuff. So usually those three tools are, are, are big in the conversation uh, and especially at, at Arctic as well. Um, and when I'm not really working with those tools, I spend a lot of time kind of just in the Kubernetes space as well. Um, Arctic is a Google Cloud partner. So uh, we spend a, a lot of time working with customers to get them enabled uh, with Google Anthos. Um, so it's funny, a lot of times in those in those projects, um, one of the HashiCorp tools comes up, whether they're looking for something like service discovery and service mesh with console, uh, whether they're looking for something like secrets management uh, with Vault or looking to kind of automate something uh, with Terraform, there's usually one of the tools that, that, that come up in conversation. So um, a lot of times these, these tools, um, I get to work with kind of both sides, uh, which, is, which is great. Um, my GitHub and Twitter handle is there too, uh, Arctic Jacob. Um, I, I'm going to show in my demo a boundary deployment, um, and, and I wrote that with, uh, it's all automated with Terraform as well. So uh, you can look at that code um, in, the, in the repository, which I'll, which I'll show after as well. <laughs> Um, so before we kind of uh, get into Boundary uh, directly, I want to take a kind of like a step back and maybe just level set on, on what I'm talking about in terms of like multi-cloud uh, and how people uh, access it, uh, can access it today. Um, so when we talk about multi-cloud, really what we're seeing and really what we're talking about is the idea of having organizations uh, as they move on into their cloud journey, uh, leverage multiple clouds to deploy their workloads. So um, as a company moves maybe from on-prem to cloud, they want to deploy some stuff in GCP. They want to deploy some stuff in AWS, uh, and they can also keep some stuff on-prem. Um, and there could be a lot of reasons for this. Um, one of the reasons really I grew up the bat is that they way, that way they don't have all of their eggs in one basket, right? They can distribute workloads across multiple clouds. Uh, and this could be for reasons like mitigating risk and, and potential downtime. Um, that way, in the event something happens in maybe GCP, um, your workloads don't go down with it. Um, you have your workloads also deployed uh, in AWS. So uh, it kind of gives you maybe that rest assurance that um, you're getting the best of both clouds um, or multiple clouds. Um, and, and the other feature is that maybe in another reason that you just solely like how one cloud offers something else better. Um, for example, uh, recently I was working with a customer um, doing a vault integration, vault integration with HSMs. Um, and one of the easy ways I found to test that was using the uh, HSM offering that AWS has, um, where something like GCP wasn't able, wasn't providing it at the time. So um, we were kind of able to to do both, right? Get the best of both worlds um, and not be solely locked into into one cloud. 
Um, so when we think about uh, next is then, okay, well, how do we access these machines, right? So we've seen the diagram here. Uh, I have a database provision in GCP and AWS, and then I have some uh, other servers deployed in VMware. Um, these are all gonna live on, on private networks, right? On private VPCs in terms of the cloud. Um, so especially now more than ever that everyone's working from home, uh, people aren't gonna be on corporate networks. So we need um, we need to get them away to get onto and get, a, and get access to these machines. Um, so easy enough, we usually just need some sort of gateway, something like a VPN, something like a Bastion host, uh, some way to get myself uh, from my home um, access to that to that private machine. So typically uh, it's something like a VPN, which actually puts us on the network. Uh, so then we're able to start going to other machines that also live, live on that network. Um, and, and as we do this, this starts to provide some potential um, issues or potential security issues uh, with doing that, with putting the actual user on the network. Um, something as simple as like, like an, a large attack vector where now that I'm on the network, I can start poking around and seeing what else do I have access to, right? What else can I kind of poke around and, and, and maybe uh, expose uh, or something like that? Um, so in that case, right, we would need something like a firewall uh, that gets, that gets um, applied to my VPN profile. So when I when I jump on the VPN um, or when my VPN gets created, I'm also gonna get a bunch of firewall um, firewall rules attached to me. Um, and and a lot of times that firewall is based on IP, right? So it's it's I'm I'm getting all my all these IPs that are added to my allow list that I'm allowed to actually go go and access. Um, and as consultants, uh, we're typically working on multiple projects at once or working with different customers at different times. Um, so we're typically uh, onboarded to a lot of to a lot of VPNs. Um, and that process takes time, right? Um, I found it's very, there's been some cases where we've been able to get a turnaround time of being onboarded to a VPN and getting the firewall rules right in the first shot, maybe like a handful, like a, a very small, it's a very small chance as compared to, um, a lot of times it take it takes a long time, uh, and typically uh, you submit the request that I want to get onboarded, uh, and I also need access to these to these servers. Um, there's a high chance that something gets missed uh, or something was typed incorrectly in the in the ticket, so that's why I don't have access. So um, as we start expanding this out, even just off of on-prem, but into AWS, GCP, and other clouds, um, this workload starts to starts to scale. Uh, very largely and, and, and potentially just not manageable. Uh, we're gonna have to hire uh, more more people at the end of the day to just basically continue uh, writing firewall rules and ensuring the VPN is is is, is up and and running and can serve everybody. Um, and and the one thing I want to touch on too was around was around the allow list and based on IP addressing. Um, and this has worked. Um, and clearly, like as we're still using it today, this works well for for static environments where, like I said, when when me as a as a consultant gets on board to a customer, um, my VPN profile is going to say, or I'm going to get an allow list that says I can access uh, these five servers, right? And that's going to be based on the IP address. Um, and 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 the issue that arises with this is we start to move to more dynamic and ephemeral world where uh, we have stuff like like auto scaling, or if we're looking in the world like Kubernetes, where um, one IP address that is assigned today may be different, uh, may be different tomorrow, right? Um, we don't. We can't solely trust IP addresses all the time in this dynamic world. Just like I said, because of that scaling up and scaling down. So um, we need a potential um, layer above that can say, "How can I just say that uh, myself, as maybe just like a database administrator, has access to the databases?" Right? Um, maybe it's not as simple as that, but that's the kind of the concept, right? Where um, database admins have access, databases developers have access to the dev machines, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's what we're looking to see if we can potentially solve for um, with Boundary. Um, and then the final piece is just around um, different clouds, um, the way they the way they handle things, right? Um, to interact with GCP workloads, we need to use like the G Cloud command uh, with AWS, the, the AWS command, Azure, the AZ command. Um, there's different ways to interact with these, these different workloads, um, which, can, which can be challenging at times, right? Or there's always a learning curve to every new cloud you bring on. Uh, whether it's like I said through the uh, through the CLI or, or through the UI. Um, so with all of that said, that's kind of where where boundary where boundary comes in. It it, it kind of fits itself in between um, in that diagram earlier between the user and then between our workloads on the other on the other side. So 
this is where I like to talk about Boundary. And it's kind of as simple as securing connect, uh, sorry, securely connect to remote machines uh, through, through Boundary. So um, I want to start off with kind of like, I guess, like the HashiCorp definition of, of, of what they, of what they um, used to define boundary. Uh, and basically it's as simple as it's, it's a secure uh, identity user uh, access tool to connect hosts and services across multiple environments, which, which we're kind of seeing here that's summed up uh, really well um, in this, in this diagram, uh, which I pulled from the, from the HashiCorp website. And, and the idea of what boundary is trying to solve for is that it's, basically a level of abstraction between myself to those to those um, end uh, targets or end workloads. Um, at the end of the day, I, I, it really shouldn't matter to me and I really shouldn't, I really don't have to care where the database is that I'm trying to connect to or the virtual machine uh, is that I'm trying to SSH into. Um, I just want to be able to say, it'd be really nice if I could just pull up something in a catalog and says, okay, I need to connect to the database. I can click it or use like a, or use the CLI and just say, I want to go to here. And Boundary takes care of getting me from point A to point B, right? To getting me to the machine that I need, whether it's in GCP, whether it's in AWS, Kubernetes, um, or, or wherever uh, that it would be. Um, so Boundary, Boundary's, uh, um, here to, is here to kind of solve that abstraction layer to basically say, uh, all I need you to do is prove yourself, prove your identity, uh, and then from there, I'll generate or I'll show you the catalog of machines that you that you have access to. Um, so it's kind of that single entry point that we were talking about um, that we were talking about earlier. Um, and and one of the big benefits with that is that is, is that security thing that is that security what we were mentioning about earlier about being on the network, right? With Boundary, I don't actually get. Um, onboarded onto the network. I don't get an IP address in that in that subnet that my databases that my VMs live in. Um, what's happening is is that Boundary is going to broker the connection for me to my to my target or to my end host uh, through a tunnel. Um, which at the end of the day is once I once I disconnect from it, I'm no longer connected to that, and I've never was actually on the network. Right. So there's no VPN. Um, there's no VPN or anything like that. It, it acts very differently and. And when I go through the architecture, uh, I'll show you how that kind of works, how that funneling, how that funneling works. Um, one thing I did touch on, so let's go back. One thing I did touch on too was was the concept of of like the catalog. Um, so I know one of the things that's that's coming, and I guess the vision for Boundary is is to leverage something uh, like Console, which which provides like service discovery uh, for your workloads. Um, so Boundary can work with something like Console to to discover as new services come up. Um, right, or as IP addresses change, um, or something like an auto scaling where new machines get added, new machines get deleted, console can take care of all the discovery for us. Um, and then it's just boundary and console that will work together to ensure that every host I see as a verified user in boundary um, is a host that is a fact, is in fact what it is, it is what, what, it, what it says it is, uh, and B um, is, is actually alive and, and healthy. Um, so I want to discuss kind of like the workflow and kind of what what this what this is looks like for the for the end user. Um, and this is kind of what I'll show when we go into the demo of, of what does the user experience experience look like. Um, so one thing that I mentioned earlier too was was the how does the user um, get to these machines, right? Like how are they like what defines them as a trusted trusted entity? Um, so typically, what this will what this will end up being from from what I can from what I can see is that um, Boundary is going to is going to work with like the trusted entities that organizations already have. So something like Okta, Active Directory, Ping, uh, very similar to to those who are familiar with Vault, where uh, a lot of times you're not going to, a lot of times you're going to integrate Vault with like an Active Directory um, or something like that for for user authentication. Um, and Boundary will behave the same way. And and what this allows you to do is this allows you uh, to remove those additional steps for for onboarding and offboarding. Um, in that when I get um, when I start a new company and once I'm uh, basically get created an Active Directory, I now also have access to Boundary, right? Um, and it's the same thing that goes for offboarding. There's there's once as soon as I move from Active Directory, um, I've lost access to Boundary and essentially any machines that I would have connected to um, down the road. Um, and the idea would be that it, it behaves the same way that kind of Vault does with 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 uh, Active Directory groups mapping them to to policies. Uh, Boundary would be able to behave uh, the same way, where um, Boundary you can leverage groups like the administrators of Boundary can can say, okay, um, all the users in the Active Directory group 
uh, database admins will say uh, has access to the databases um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so looking at that experience overall in this complete cir circle is that a user uh, such as such as myself, right? I would come to Boundary and I would authenticate with the with the uh, identity provider that we have. So we'll assume like it's Active Directory. Um, from there, I'm going to go ahead and authenticate. And then once I'm authenticated, Boundary is then going to say, okay, here are the here are the hosts that you have access to, right? Um, so again, we'll assume a database administrator I authenticate. I can now see all the databases that I have access to, um, and it could be as simple as just like a pointing and clicking and saying, okay, I want to go ahead and click that. Uh, like I said too, uh, you could also leverage like the CLI as well. Um, and then from there, it's now that I go ahead and click it, what actually happens for me getting to that host? How does that authentication work uh, from me to, to the database, right? Um, so uh, right now, just because Boundary, it, Boundary is a new tool, right? So there's tons of features being constantly added to it. Um, again, this is kind of more like a, a future vision state but the idea would be that Boundary will interact with, with Vault uh, or could interact with Vault to generate those secrets dynamically when requested, when, uh, when uh, access is requested. So again, we'll assume I'm a, I'm a database admin. Um, I no longer have to worry about A, where it is like network location based on IP. Um, I also don't have to worry about the providing the username and password for it, uh, because a lot of times, and, and I've seen this before, is you're, you're not going to remember those username and passwords at the top of your head. They're typically probably stored somewhere on your computer, like like or I, or in Slack uh, or or somewhere where um, maybe they shouldn't maybe they shouldn't be. Um, so to increase security overall, what we can do is we can leverage uh, Vault and Boundary together to say when I go ahead and click to access the, the database. Um, Boundary and Vault can work together to generate those database credentials dynamically. And me as the end user, I don't even have to see what the password or what that username uh, ends up being. I just wanna be able to connect to, to the database. As long as I can do that and, and do the work that I need to, um, I'm perfectly fine never seeing that username and password. Um, and again, if those are familiar with Vault, Vault does a very good job at generating dynamic credentials, uh, associating a, a lease to it. Um, and, and again, once once uh, once that lease is up, Vault will take care of revoking those uh, revoking those credentials. So um, even if somebody did ever see them um, and the and the and then they expired, they wouldn't be able to use them on the database. Um, so last slide before we before we get into the actual demo, um, and and this is the architecture in a multi-cloud scenario. So um, right now, uh, I, I believe on the Boundary website there is the reference architecture for AWS. Um, I basically just recreated it here, um, and then I added uh, my little snippet on the right um, with uh, with GCP, uh, and that's just because um, the the demo I'm going to show next is leveraging both of those clouds. Um, so that's where I kind of just shifted um, the, the diagram over, um, tweaked it a bit, and then added my GCP uh, piece to it. But overall, this is like a rough uh, high level um, architecture diagram for boundary. Um, and, and there's three key aspects here that I want to that I want to hone in on. So the idea would be that as a user, I'm going to come in and connect to boundary uh, via the via the controller and and the controller and boundary is responsible basically for understanding um, any configuration. So this is where you would set up uh, boundary. Um, this is where users authenticate and authorize users and then overall serve like any API requests that it sees. So um, this is where users would authenticate and see their catalog. Um, everything is done through through the controllers there. Um, Underneath the controllers is where we have our workers and the workers are basically those machines that are responsible for doing that brokerage connection that I was talking about. Um, so the idea is that as a user, I would come in and say, okay, I, I would hit the controller and say, here's all the databases that I have access to. Uh, I can go ahead and click the database and boundary um, is then it, boundary is then responsible for saying, okay, you're going to access the database, uh, that private database through this controller, and then it's going to set up that connection from me through the controller to that end target, which is living on the on the private subnet. Um, and and then then just the last point here is that um, a target is really just anything that it represents a a workload that a user would connect to. Uh, so like I said, we've said something like um, a, a Linux machine, uh, a database. Um, you can do uh, RDP connections as well, um, and, and and I believe there'll be will probably be a lot more coming uh, coming down the line. 
Okay, cool. So that's uh, it for slides. Uh, and then I want to focus the rest of the time on, um, on the demo. So for this demo here, um, I'm, I'm basically going to show how I can connect to two virtual machines that are living on private VPCs and GCP uh, and, and AWS and connect to them from my laptop. Uh, like I said, through, through no VPN, just um, all through Boundary. So I'm going to go through the exercise of setting up Boundary adding those hosts um, to my as targets in boundary and then and then connecting to them. Um, so for those any of those uh, who are interested in actually seeing the the Terraform code, uh, like I said, here is the repository for it here, uh, just called boundary multi cloud demo um, and it has everything in there. Um, the, the Terraform code to stand this up uh, is not uh, the is shouldn't uh, be used in production um, sort of stuff. I'm not using like a like a like a cloud KMS or anything, which which you, uh, which I believe you should use uh, for a production instance. Um, and I've done like some sort of shortcuts with without TLS and, and stuff like that. But um, it the the base code is there for sure to to get started if you're interested. Um, so I have a few tabs set up right here. Um, I have Boundary, which I'm should be logged into still. Just make sure. Yep. Okay. So I have Boundary, the Boundary UI here, and then I also have um, my GCP um my gcp console and then my aws console as well um so what we're going to do is we're going to create uh basically go through everything to to create the boundary uh, uh setup for us so we see here that uh everything is scoped by organizations to start so i can go ahead and click on the organization i made for hashi talks uh and the next thing we need to create is a project uh so for here i'll just call this uh hashi talks 2021 and once I do that, I need to create what's called my host catalogs. Um, so the host catalogs is the, the way I've interpreted it is a way to kind of group your hosts. Um, in this case, would be group them by cloud, right? So if I have my, um, I can say all my AWS um, resources belong in this host catalog, uh, all the GCP ones belong in this host catalog. So I'll first start by creating my um, AWS one, so Amazon Web Services. And then I will create my GCP one. Um, the other thing I should add too is that um, when when Boundary got released, a right, right away they came out with uh, the Terraform a Terraform provider for it as well to kind of automate all of this, uh, which is something I would definitely recommend checking out and, and doing if you want to stand up Boundary yourself. Um, I'm just doing this kind of all manually here to, to walk through the workflow and, and kind of talk through each little uh, piece of boundary. But like I said, um, day one, they, they came out with a, with a Terraform provider to kind of um, take care of all this for you. So um, you don't have to do it manually, manually every time. Um, so the next thing we need to create here is our, uh, is our host sets. Um, and the idea with the host sets here, what we're going to use it for is that it's, it's how we're going to separate our environments. Um, so in here, I want to create a host set that's going to say, these are all of my dev hosts, uh, dev hosts in, in Amazon. So I can just do AWS uh, dev. And then on the other side, I'll do it with GCP as well. I can do um, uh, GCP dev and Safari tries to autocorrect it for me, uh, GCP dev, cool. Okay, so uh, let's click on AWS. We have our host set. And now what we can do is, is create the actual create the actual host uh, that we're gonna connect to. So like I said, right now, um, this, is, this is a very manual process just because um, I, I think on the roadmap, the idea is, right, is to connect this to something like console so that way, uh, and use something like service discovery to kind of uh, pre uh, populate all of these hosts for us. So it's not such a manual exercise. Uh, but like I said, for right now, uh, you could do it the manual way, which, which maybe I, I probably wouldn't recommend, uh, but you could use something like the Terraform module to help kind of set all this up for you um, to populate all this data. So you're not manually clicking around to add hosts um, or having to do it through like the boundary CLI. Uh, so we'll go ahead and add a new host and we're going to call this dev host. Um, and then what I'll do is I'm going to flip over to Amazon and what we'll do is so see, I don't have a public IP address. So I'll just copy the private IP, head back over to here and paste that IP. Uh, so I can go ahead and click save. And then I can do the same thing. Uh, just let me make sure I got added. Um, yeah, so uh, one second. Um, I'll just uh, add existing host. There we go. Okay, and then I'll do that for GCP as well. So host sets, hosts, and then I can create and add a new host. 
So I'll do GCP dev. And then I will go over here and grab my boundary target. Uh, so again, we can see uh, it doesn't have an external IP. It just has an internal IP address. So basically what happens is when I'm ready to connect to this target, um, boundary is going to facilitate connecting me to the worker, which does have a public IP. And then it, because it also has a NIC on the same private, uh, on that private VPC, it's able to connect me and able to route me to this, to this target right here. Uh, so I'll go ahead and click that, go back over here. Okay. Uh, now if I just go back over to, just want to make sure I got added host sets, hosts. Okay, cool. All right. So now that we've set everything up, what we need to do is create the actual targets that users will connect to. Um, so a lot of that host, a lot of that host stuff we just set up would kind of be on the, um, on the operations team to figure out, uh, and you're not actually connecting to it. What the end users are, are going to end up connecting to is is the host targets. So, uh, so I'll go ahead and create a target here, and I'll just call this one AWS. I could be auto corrected again. Say so no. Uh, and then the default port is 22. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll add the host set and I'll add my AWS ones. And then I'll do the same thing for GCP. So I'll go GCP uh, 22 as well. And then go into host sets and then I will add my GCP host set. Cool. Okay, so now everything is set up and what I'll do is I'll flip over to the sessions tab because I'll show you that uh, shortly. Uh, but I'm gonna flip over to the terminal here. And the first thing I need to do is I need to make sure I have my boundary address uh, exported. So again, those are familiar with like Vault or something like that. Um, in order to use like the, the, the CLI tool, uh, you can just export your environment variable um, like that. The, the next thing we need to do is we need to authenticate to boundary. So uh, we could do that with a boundary authenticate. Uh, I'm just authenticating as the admin user. Uh, and then I can go ahead and add my password. And now I'm essentially authenticated to boundary. Um, so now what we can do is as a user, I can go ahead and look at all of the um, or all of the targets that I have access to. So I can do a boundary targets list, uh, then pass in scope ID, and then I just need to grab the actual project here, which is that. Uh, okay, now I can see that I have access to the AWS and GCP target. Uh, so all that's left to do is actually connect to it. Uh, so let's go ahead and do a boundary connect SSH. Uh, target ID, and I'll connect to the GCP one first, just to show that. And now we can see that I've kind of just got a, uh, again, a stage fingerprint uh, warning, just go ahead and say yes. And now we can see that I'm connected to, to GCP, right? Uh, we can see that I'm connected to that boundary target, which had the same host name. Uh, and the other thing we can see if we go back over to sessions is that we now see an active session for this user, right? And this is super powerful because if for whatever reason we need to stop a session, uh, I could just go like that, cancel. If we flip back over, I'm kicked out, right? Which is pretty cool. Uh, so let's just do quickly uh, on the for, uh, connect to the AWS instance. Uh, so I'll go ahead and change this. And then you can see as we're doing this, what's, what's pretty awesome is that I haven't had to flip between um, tools or anything. I've been able to use Boundary um, as an end user for, for to connect to two different hosts, uh, two different clouds. Uh, so I'll go ahead and now try to connect to the AWS one. Uh, I've seen this before, just need to, there we go. Oops, uh, to specify the username. Uh, just you want to. <laughs> I found that sometimes it hangs. Um, so just give it a sec. Uh, there we go. And now we can see that I've connected to, to the AWS instance as well. Uh, and again, if we go back over here, uh, yeah, we can see it. I'm seeing, I've been seeing some weird issues recently uh, today with it where it's kind of like hung, but it's actually created the session. Um, but the idea here is if we look at our last one right here is that we see the active session, we see the target was AWS. Uh, and again, we could do the same thing where actually if I exit, do it myself, we can see that this the connection was terminated. Uh, let me cancel these as well. Uh, and again, the same sort of thing where if I connect to it, um, what's going to happen is that I can also cancel this session um, on the other side as well by just clicking, clicking here. Uh, yeah, so that's so that's it for the uh, for the demo. Um, I hope this kind of gave um, a brief, I guess, overview and, and introduction to a using Boundary and to use it um, uh, across multiple clouds. Uh, like I said, it's it's been a it's been a great tool to work with to, to try to 
uh, test out how I can, like as an end user, connect to multiple workloads and multiple clouds. Um, like I said, so Boundary has been great so far. I'm really excited to see uh, where the tool goes next uh, with its integrations with on the authentication side um, and with the with the other uh, HashiCorp tools like uh, like console and console and vault.